Right, good morning to our wonderful audience and uh, welcome back to Boutiques on Wednesdays where we keep you updated on an ever-changing investment landscape with a view shared by some of the top local fund uh, managers as well as global fund managers. Maybe just a quick reminder on that hold slide we had up just now, uh, you saw the address for the new uh, portal for our fund managers or BCI investment partners. So any kind of investment information you want on any of the BCI partners, please have a look at the new website or portal. Uh, you can find a link on the BCI website as well uh, to have a look at that. It's my great privilege to welcome our moderator to the session and well known to all, Florbella Yates, Head of Equilibrium by Momentum, probably one of the longest standing asset consulting businesses in South Africa, uh, or rather known by the industry as a DFM. Uh, Florbella, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, you come with a wealth of experience, you and your team, when looking at asset allocation, but more specifically, uh, dealing with fund managers, and I know you are very familiar uh, with the team of Vigio that will join you as well. Uh, so thank you for your time this morning, and you are welcome to start and introduce your panel for the morning. Thank you, Eugene. It's always an honor to um, work with BCI. Um, so maybe just to start, today we have the Vizio team with us. And um, the first speaker is going to be Jonathan Marson. And um, Johnny is the head of fixed income as well as the co portfolio manager for the Visio BCI Balanced Fund. And um, he's a manager that we use extensively in our portfolios. Um, and I don't think you need much more introduction than that. Um, and Johnny's going to discuss uh, Visio's views on both global and domestic asset classes um, and their valuations, as well as the balanced mandate positioning in a very challenging environment. Um, and then following him, we've got Keris Foster. I'm sure you all know Keris as well. He's the London-based associate for global and SA equities. Um, and Keris will discuss Visio BCI Global Equity Fund, um, the key global investment themes that he's seeing, um, and then the opportunities in both developed and emerging market equities. Um, Johnny and uh, Keris, would you like to spend some time with you? I'm going to hand it over to you, Johnny. Thanks, Flabella. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thanks, BCI. Um, yeah, as Flabella mentioned, um, the, the, the uh, Visio Balance Fund um, has been running now for just over three years. Um, I'm a co manager together with uh, Patrice Moyal, the CIO, and um, Keris um, looks after the, uh, the global um, um, equity. Um, allocation. Um, I'll spend a little bit more time on the global backdrop and then um, drill into the South African val and, and valuation. Um, so first of all, um, you know, you'd be very familiar with the um, global economic growth, uh, which is slowing down and the chart on the left basically shows you kind of a bit of history um, and where we are now. This is consensus forecast uh, for aggregate go global growth. Um, so certain moderation after the phenomenal recovery uh, post-COVID um, and, you know, not surprising that we had the recovery. What is maybe a little bit surprising is the relative resilience uh, that the global economy is showing given um, what you can see on the right-hand side, and that is, um, you know, the, the tightening of monetary policy. Really, um, you can see that um, the last hiking cycle, which um, possibly is um, it done, maybe there's another 25 basis points uh, to come, um, and that's probably going to be it. You know, we'll, we'll know later today if it's a, a pause and a continuation, maybe in July, but ultimately we're pretty much there. But 500 basis points, not only that it's the largest, uh, you know, we've seen over the last 40 years, but it also from an extremely low base. So if you just think of the kind of, you know, the, the, the extreme um, tightness that we've seen, yet markets seem to be, uh, economies seem to be handling it reasonably well. Um, and that's the case um, in most place, places where there's this moderation in growth. And you can see uh, on aggregate, the um, developing markets um, are expected to grow lower, um, but slowly, more slowly in the next uh, two years than they have in the um, previous 10 years. Uh, the same everywhere other than Japan. And Japan is uh, an outlier in some ways. And um, I think later on you'll you'll you know, realize why we kind of maybe spending a little bit more time on that market because it's really uh, a little bit unique in the cycle. Um, inflation is slowing down. 
um, you can see the, um, the, the, the kind of um, middle bars are showing uh, the current inflation, um, which is significantly higher than the pre-COVID average, uh, but declining pretty much everywhere. Um, and you know, I think the, the point that one needs to make here is that you know, there was a lot of discussion around pause, uh, you know, Fed pause, um, central banks um, you know, stopping um, the, the hiking cycle. The point of the matter, maybe the focus should be more like how long do they keep rates elevated? And our view right now is that rates are pretty much um, at the top of the hiking cycle, but given the strong uh, growth, given that inflation is still in most places materially higher than what central banks would be comfortable with, um, rates will remain high for longer. Um, and that essentially has a lot of influence, obviously, on um, the way we, we position the portfolios. Um, if you add those two, you know, real GDP and nominal GDP, uh, sorry, real GDP and inflation, you get the picture of nominal GDP. Um, and here, where we spoke about the uniqueness of Japan, um, you can see that developed markets uh, nominal GDP is probably going to end up uh, in the next year slightly higher than it was uh, pre in the previous, uh, uh, actually 20 years um, to previous to COVID, the same for emerging markets. But Japan has seen a massive increase. And you, really, you have to remember that inflation is bad when it's particularly high. Inflation is good when it's low, but deflation is very bad. And Japan has moved from a deflationary environment to an inflationary environment, which is low. It's low, it's still below the kind of, uh, you know, the, um, the target range, but certainly um, one that is incentivizing a normal functioning of an economy. And we've already seen some performance um, linked to that. And of course, South Africa, we're still struggling with, with growth. The nominal GDP is actually expected to um, contract a little bit um, over the next, um, or decline a little bit over the next um, um, two years or so. Now, when you move to, to valuations and you look at the kind of um, and, and first of all, looking at equities um, in particular, the easiest, and there are lots of ways of doing it, but you know, price earning ratio, most people will be familiar with. And you can see on the left, South Africa is relative to its history, very low, one standard deviation and below its 15 year mean, where the other extreme is the US. The US is, again, you'll probably be very familiar, uh, S&P 500 at almost one standard deviation above its long term mean. Um, so just when we look at kind of domestic versus global, and obviously global is much broader than just the S&P 500, but it does make up 60 um, odd percent of our global benchmark, this is very important. We've got it relatively cheap for some good reason, but yet maybe too cheap. And, you know, on the other side, you know, we've got the, the, the other extreme. So we need to find, you know, where we want to be and how we want to allocate. But taking it a step further, looking at how these um, equities look against the other competing assets, is bonds um, in both cases in South Africa and in the US, bonds are more attractive um, than equities on valuation basis. And the lower this black line, essentially, what you take is your earning yield minus the, the bond yield, and you have this relative attractiveness. So it looks to us that South African bonds are still providing, offering more value than domestic equities, um, and in the US, it's even more so. So what we've got is we've got Equities that are expensive, bonds are better value, um, and uh, you know are probably the, the place that you want to be over overweight for for now. So the way we, we then take this information is each one of our um, teams that look at uh, equ domestic equity, global equities, uh, global bond, domestic bonds. We we do our fundamental analysis and we do a bottom up um, um, work and we get an expected return from the individual asset classes. So what we expect the individual asset classes to do over the next 12 months or so is you can see in the red dots here. So we expect domestic equities make sense, low PEs, some normalization. You know, there will be, I think, in, in all equity markets, there will be some headwinds from maybe earnings not being as um, or growing as, as high as you would have liked given the economic growth is going down. But domestically, we expect you know, domestic equities to return 13%. Uh, domestic property 16 and, and so on. And on the global side, and this is obviously talks to the currency as well, the issue here is always trying to work out what the rain's going to do. We take a longer term approach here, we do we look at purchasing power parity, and we assume that over a three year period, we reach, um, we return to fair value. 
Uh, currently, the, the currency is clearly um, undervalued. You know, the, the debate could go and, and how much and how long it will take to, to return. But ultimately, we prefer uh, domestic assets onto global, on global assets because of valuations. So now, automatically, when you look at this, you'd think we're immediately going to be very overweight, um, say, domestic equities um, and, um, you know, uh, underweight domestic cash. Now, what the objective of the fund is obviously to return CPI plus five. So what we're looking for is looking for the highest or the, 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 the highest probability of an asset that will give us that return. Now, the higher volatility of an asset, the, the more the risk that that return won't be what we need it to be. So in other words, in short, um, if domestic bonds and domestic equities are expected to return the same kind of number, we definitely prefer domestic bonds over domestic equities um, in this environment, given that we think that there are some um, uncertainties coming through. So the exposure to the uh, different asset classes, you can see we underweight domestic equity, um, and it makes a lot of sense. It's easiest to explain against domestic bonds, the same return, much less volatile, we'll sit with that. Domestic property, um, we'd want to be of, um, uh, we'll, we want to be actually neutral now. We've moved to neutral, even though they are providing a 16% expected return. The volatility of the asset class has just gone through the roof, and we're therefore a little bit more comfortable to sit at what we consider to be neutral. On the right hand side is the global story uh, offshore equities, um, underweight um, because of those expensive valuations. There are great opportunities, and Keras will speak to them. Um, we are overweight offshore cash just because we think, and cash is not zero. Cash, just to, you have to remind you that on that cash, we're getting 4.5% in, in hard currencies. So that's a, a bit easier to sit with than it used to be you know, two, three years ago. Um, if I just look um, my last slide before I pass on to, to Keras, look at the historical asset allocation of the fund over the last few years, maybe focusing more on the last um, you know, 12 to 18 months. Um, so we um, have been increased exposure to increasing exposure to bonds from um, you know late last year um, it's been a rocky a rocky road we, you know certain uh, geopolitical and uh, political decisions have made it a bit more difficult than South African uh, risk uh, is applied implied risk is much higher than it uh, was before um, you know we've we've had the most recent events um, bottom line is that uh, we now 20 percent on, on bonds um, and we've moved from May last month. So the change that we've made on the bonds is that up till May, we were short duration. So in other words, lower interest rate risk. What we've done um, subsequently during May uh, and, in, and in, uh, in June, uh, we've increased that duration quite a lot. So you know, if we were duration of one below our, our benchmark, we now have gone to one uh, plus. So that's kind of just conveying that kind of message. And also importantly, um, we increased our exposure to domestic equities. Um, you know, valuations became a bit more attractive, so we used cash um, to allocate into, into um, domestic um, equities as well. And we were looking to, to kind of um, move actually in the global um, portion from um, cash first into um, global bonds. We are a little, little bit underweight. There's still, we've been increased exposure there, and we think at these kind of levels, it's probably start with. Um, with um, taking exposure to. So I'll leave it at that. I'll pass on to Keras to speak to the uh, global equity opportunities. And um, over to you, Keras. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, and thank you, Flabella, and to the BCR team for the opportunity to, to speak to you today. Um, as mentioned, I'm coming to you from a rather balmy and sunny London. Um, and it's not often I get to say that. So I thought I'd just throw that in there. Um, if we look at the, the, the global investment universe, I think it's fair to say that we are living in um, uh, a very dynamic environment. Uh, there's a lot of change that is happening. And I thought it'd be useful to just touch on some of the, the, the bigger themes that speak to the opportunity set and how that opportunity set may evolve over time. Um, I've, I've listed four broad themes here. This is no, by no means uh, you know, exhaustive. Um, but these are some of the bigger themes that will shape the investment universe, I think, going forward. Um, the first one that I want to touch on is the emerging consumer and urbanization. This is something that's been with us for some time. Um, we're certainly seeing things like shifting demographics, the increase of um, uh, elderly populations, people over 65s, um, you know, globally rising incomes, um, a more prosperous consumer, 
Um, and what this speaks to is emerging consumer trends and how those may shape things going forward. I mean, for example, um, you know, if you look at the, the EU Commission is, is forecasting that by 2030, we're going to see 5.3 billion middle class consumers spending about $64 trillion. And that, that's about a third of GDP growth um, going forward. So I think it's a very meaningful driver uh, in terms of some of the trends that we're going to see. Um, other things to consider here would be things like, um, you know, evolving consumer considerations around their environmental impacts and how that's going to, to, to play out in the way that they consume things. Another very big uh, theme that, that is very topical at the moment is the energy transition. Um, I would liken this to you know, the, the industrial revolution or the introduction of the first cars. Um, you know, what's clearly behind this is, is things like climate change and net zero, um, but there's been some very significant enablers here that are driving this at pace. And one of those is the achievement of uh, cost parity amongst between renewable energy sources and traditional carbon-based uh, energy sources. Um, and and that, that's going to accelerate the adoption going forward. Um, as, as, as with many of these transitions, this is not an instantaneous thing. Um, I think we're going to be seeing these effects take place over decades rather than just the very short term. Um, and there's certainly many challenges that need to be overcome to, to enable this. Um, so we need new technologies. For example, we need um, long-term storage solutions. You know, um, these renewable energy sources aren't as reliable or as consistent as, 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 as fossil-based fuels. Um, and so I think what this mean, speaks to is the, the potential for new technologies, new investment opportunities, and a lot of new investment um, that, that's going to have to go into, for example, the the way that we distribute and consume uh, uh, energy going forward. Um, here again, very significant investments. Uh, UBS are estimating that about $160 trillion of investment will be required to enable this energy transition. Um, we also need to give some thought to, to the disruptive effects of, of, of these, these, these new technologies and how this transition plays out. Um, that, potentially could you know, be a, a threat to certain, certain business models. But at the same time, I don't think we must lose sight of the fact that we're still going to be very dependent on carbon-based energy sources for a substantial period of time still. We cannot just switch over immediately as much as we'd all like to. Um, and that means that there will probably still be opportunities within older technologies um, going forward. So uh, I think there's opportunities on both fronts there. Um, the, other, the other big theme, of course, is the digital age, the internet of things. Um, um, this is very topical at the moment. Um, clearly, we are consuming and producing more and more data uh, each and every day. We're seeing exponential growth in data. We need systems, devices to store that data, to process it. Um, things like quantum computing are coming to the fore. We are seeing increased automation in pretty much every field, whether that's from manufacturing to transport to, to, to other fields. And then of course, the, the, the very topical subject of artificial intelligence and how that may play a role going forward in terms of the way we, 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 we both uh, operate and in terms of the investment universe. Here again, a very substantial investment requirement um, it's estimated, uh, you know, one and a half trillion dollars of internet investment just through things like connected device, um, increasing revenue by 2030. Another field that's also uh, perhaps, um, you know, more at the forefront now is things like biotechnology. Um, this has the potential for, for transformational technologies in many areas. Um, everything from the way we produce food, for example, um, to future medicine, genome sequencing, and what that means for medicine development, for understanding, um, you know, uh, things like disease burdens, et cetera, et cetera. And here again, um, you know, things like synthetic biology is, is, is going to be a big part uh, of, of this landscape going forward. And again, um, very significant investments over a trillion dollars uh, into that sort of space. Um, you know, I, I think these, these are, the, the, the reason why I touch on these is, is that I think these themes are going to be a feature of the investment universe going forward, irrespective of what happens to the macro backdrop. 
So, you know, I think there will be periods where we will go through headwinds that will perhaps slow the, the, the rate of a change that, that's taking place here. Um, but I certainly don't foresee that these are going to be reversed or disappear. And I think they're going to be a feature of the investment universe for a long time to come. Could perhaps move on to the next slide, please, Jonathan. In terms of the, the, the global equity fund, then just at the high level, I mean, typically this is a, a, a fairly concentrated portfolio of our best ideas. It's typically in the region of uh, 30 to 35 stocks. Um, and I just wanted to touch on some of the portfolio selection uh, elements that we go through as a team. Um, we typically try to invest in robust business models supported by some of those longer term trends that I've just touched on um, with competent management. Um, one of the other things we, we, we try to identify is business models that exhibit pricing power and superior margins. Uh, that speaks to a competitive strength, and that's particularly loose, useful in periods of, uh, say, high inflation, which is something that we're going through at the moment. Um, we also try and, 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 and monitor things like returns over the longer term. And really what we're trying to establish here is that, uh, that these business models are not exhibiting evidence of structural fade or disruption because um, uh, that's, that's a very important consideration about the longevity of these business models and, and where they are in their, their, their life cycles. Um, we also try and, 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 and couple that with an emphasis on strong balance sheet. Um, you'll see that over 40% of the portfolio companies we're invested in actually currently have net cash positions. I think that's, that's a, a really useful position to be in, especially in times where things are less certain and there may be more adversity. It just gives greater flexibility to respond to, to those sort of environments. Um, we don't rule out special situations. Um, we do look at them, um, you know, things like perhaps uh, certain value opportunities. But I guess the key issue for, for us here is that we need to understand that the, or, or at least perceive that there's a catalyst for that value delivery to be to be unlocked. And I guess also at the same time, all of the above need to come at a reasonable valuation. Um, I've just put some metrics here and, and, and chosen at random some of the sort of stocks that we're invested in. You can see in general high returns on capital versus their costs of capital, um, you know, strong balance sheets, higher GP margins, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and again, also um, uh, at a reasonable uh, forward valuation. Next slide, please, Jonathan. If we look at the, the geographic exposures of, of the fund as it currently stands, um, and I've just highlighted some of the sort of uh, more, more, more interesting names within the fund as well, um, just out of interest. Um, what I really want to touch on here is um, just looking at, at the spread. Um, and, and, and I thought it'd be useful to compare the way we're positioned on a geographic exposure allocation relative to, for example, the MSCI World Index, which is one of the benchmarks that, that, that is typically used for, for, for global uh, investments. It's worth pointing out that that MSCI World Index excludes emerging markets. It's only a developed market index. Um, so that's why you'll see a, a very high weighting to, for example, the USA within that index. And relative to that, you'll see that we are, are certainly, from a, a U.S. perspective, currently lower uh, on the exposure relative to that, with, um, although you see 48%, the, the underlying equity exposure here is, is at about 32%, the rest largely being sort of bonds and cash. Um, we are, in terms of EMEA, you'll see that we are certainly more weighted in, in, in the, this, this uh, field relative to the underlying benchmark. And then Asia Pacific is also a standout differentiator for us at this point in time. Uh, and I'd like to highlight the fact that we do have an exposure to Japan. Um, I'm going to touch on that in a little bit more detail uh, further on in the presentation. Um, China is also uh, an important part of our exposure. Uh, and again, this is a differentiator relative to that MSCI World Index because China doesn't form part of that index. Um, and then, of course, the other thing I would also draw attention to, and it's a very early days for us in the fund, is that we have a very early stage investment into India. Um, I think India is also very interesting. It's, it's at the point where perhaps China was 20 years ago, 
And we, it's, it's, although it's early days, I think India is going to be an area that we're going to be very focused on going forward. And we're doing a lot more work to, to understand the space uh, and, 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 and try to identify opportunities for investment uh, over the longer term. In terms of the, the, the next slide, I think it's just, you know, wanted to, to highlight that within a, a concentrated portfolio, say 30 positions, one of the key questions would be, you know, is there sufficient diversification? Um, and this is just a snapshot of, of the fund. And I think uh, what this clearly demonstrates is that there's a, a broad exposure here across very different sectors. So I think uh, the answer is yes, I think we can achieve um, a reasonable sense of, of diversification within a concentrated uh, portfolio. Um, in terms of moving on then, I think rather than touching on some of the more familiar names within the, the, the global fund, I thought I'd maybe move into something that's a little bit newer in terms of positioning within the fund. And that is the exposure to, to um, Japanese stocks. I mean, Jonathan gave a, a useful sort of backdrop from a macroeconomic perspective as to why Japan looks interesting um, as, as a region. But I think it goes uh, well beyond that. Uh, and, and that is really because if we think about the history of, of, of Japanese companies, I mean, many instances, um, they, there's a lot of cross holdings um, in Japan. Um, management are ne not necessarily incentivized in, in, in an investor friendly manner. A lot of them are just incentivized on, on, on a sort of a remuneration basis that is sort of based on uh, product performance and, and, and the like rather than in investor specific metrics. Um, and and um, I, I think there's a bit of a sea change that's happening within Japan at the moment um, as far as um, uh, thinking around value and the way that that value could, should be realized for, for shareholders. Um, the Japan Stock Exchange uh, is effectively a, a sort of a three-tier system where you have the sort of premium element of companies, the next tier, and then what they call the sort of high growth companies. And each of those have slightly different um, uh, 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 rules uh, as far as the, the stock exchange is concerned. And what's very interesting is if you look back at the, you know, the, the history and, and, and look within those, those sort of tiers, approximately 50% of the listed companies on the prime market, which is the top tier, and over 60% in the standard market, the next tier, have very low returns on equity. So they're typically below 8%. And their share prices are trading below their net asset values. So price to book ratio is below one. What that's saying is that the, the, the stock market is assuming that although that there's, a, there's, there's, there's a lot of value inherent in these companies, there's an underlying assumption that management is somehow going to destroy value um, going forward. And the ways that that can happen is through poor capital allocation decisions or sitting on, on excess cash that is generating very low returns. Um, what's changed, um, uh, and, and this has come about partly because we've seen increased pressure from uh, you know, notable activist shareholders. We've also seen letters being written to the Japanese government and to the Tokyo Stock Exchange with over 200 sort of PRI global investor signatories calling for change um, to, 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 to try and change the situation and change the thinking within management teams um, within Japanese companies. Uh, and I've, I've shown some examples, and these are excerpts from a presentation that came from the Japan, uh, the Tokyo Stock Exchange actually in March of this year, um, where they are now calling for actions from management teams to, to implement a, a, a process that increases management's focus on things like cost of capital, where their share prices are, and how they can actually improve um, the, the, the sort of value being uh, ascribed to, to shareholders. And, and that's calling on, on management teams to analyze where they are in the current situation, to properly understand their cost of capital and their profitability, and, and think about the market valuation in the context of that. Um, it also calls them to, to, to plan and disclose how they're going to develop policies and targets and planning periods and specific initiatives to address some of these things. And then also how they're going to communicate that with shareholders going forward. Um, and, and what this does is it starts a dialogue 
that can then be perhaps brought into the realm of things like rewarding management in a different way that is perhaps better aligned to, to, shareholder, to shareholder interests. Um, some of the things that, that, that could also address these shortcomings would include things like board changes to increase independence. The, 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 the independence levels of boards in Japan are typically very low, and that's because of, in many instances, there's these cross holdings and you have uh, people being nominated from, from those cross shareholdings. Um, I've already touched on the improved focus on capital allocation and how that brings about alignment with shareholders via remuneration changes. And it also opens things like the potential for share buybacks. I mean, historically, that's, that's not been a feature of, of, of the market, and in part because of, 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 of these cross holdings, because it can change the, the underlying uh, economic interest of those cross holdings uh, over time. Thank you, Jonathan. Just the next slide then. So if we talk about specifically how we've um, started playing some Japanese exposure. Um, it's currently in, in, in nine stocks across many industries. So there isn't a particular theme that we're looking for here um, as far as company specifics goes. Um, you know, it, it's quite a diverse set of companies. But, but what, is, what is interesting is that they typically in the sort of mid-cap uh, sort of size-wise um, and what's what's interesting is that they're, they're all sitting on a large proportion of cash as 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 a function of their market cap. Uh, you know, on average, these companies are sitting at at half of their market cap in in, in cash. And not only that, um, you know, over and above those cash holdings, in many instances, they're sitting on other investments that are outside of their core businesses themselves. And those investments typically have values as well. Um, and and and. You can see uh, in av on, on average, you know, these, these uh, are also a material part uh, when you look at that relative to, to the market cap of the company. So if we just look at the cash and those, the value of those investments uh, divided by the market cap, you can almost get the, the market cap, which is implying that the, you know, the underlying businesses themselves are, are not really being valued uh, at much by, by the markets. And again, you know, I've touched on it before, the, the, the price to asset values are trading at a discount, which suggests that investors are assuming that value destruction is going to be a part of these things going forward. And what we're hoping for here is really that there's going to be a medium term uplift in returns um, as some of these changes are brought about from pressure from both the government, from the, the, the stock exchange and from, from, from investors themselves. Um, hopefully, there'll be plans to reduce cross shareholdings. Um, hopefully, we will see introduced changes to the boards, which will be more shareholder friendly and independent. And then a more balanced capital allocation framework going forward with improved shareholder returns. I think the significant cash holdings and the value of those investments also provide for us some sort of a measure of downside protection here. So I think it's, it's, you know, we like to see that sort of symmetry of, of potential risk reward. Um, and, and hopefully that, that uh, will over time uh, real, be realized as, 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 a, as a positive return for us as shareholders. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks, Gareth. So before I hand um, back to uh, Flabella, um, just um, quickly to um, share the um, funds um, uh, kind of um, performance. Um, it's been a, a difficult three years uh, in the market, um, but the fund's been able to provide um, and meet its objective and uh, both um, do um, you know well against the peer group and uh, provide the CPI plus five, which is going to be challenging going forward. Um, yet um, I think something that we're going to certainly uh, continue trying to achieve. Um, and talking about the kind of difficult period that the, the fund uh, was launched into, um, just uh, quickly, the, the red line here is uh, the implied um, S&P volatility, uh, and you can see for most of the period, it's been above the long-term average. So it has been uh, a period where uh, being able to move from one asset class to another, being able to be nimble and um, you know, kind of um, adjust to market conditions has been particularly important. And that's something I think that this fund um, does offer, and um, yeah, we'll, we'll continue doing so. So... Done with that, Flavella, over to you. Thank you. Um, I think two very interesting presentations. So thank you, Jonathan and Karis. Um, please, if any of the participants have questions, feel free to pop them onto the Q&A section and I'll try and get to those. Um, but I've got a couple of questions um, for each of the speakers. I'm going to start off with you, Johnny. 
Um, I noticed when you put up your asset allocation views that both local and offshore cash had the lowest expected returns out of all the asset classes. And um, if I'm correct, I think your local cash, you had a 9% expected return and offshore 6%. Now, you've been under um, overweight cash, sorry, since the middle of 2022. Are you still comfortable with that position? And what would need to change for you to start reducing the cash exposure in favor of some of the more risky assets? So, so Ben, I think the, the kind of the, 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 the way we, we look at it is, um, you know, we interest rates have been rising, the um, return on liquid assets cash short term and when i talk about cash i talk about um up to 12 months really um where we could get uh, relatively attractive returns um and um you know it was almost like a, a place to park money um and basically protect some capital because of course that's something it's not only about um you know catching the the runs it's also trying to avoid the um as, as called like the, the the potholes um so so that's kind of in terms of when when we change that, we have been starting. As I mentioned, uh, we've reduced the domestic um, exposure to cash, both to, into equity and increased our uh, interest rate exposure across the, along the, the yield curve. Um, offshore, what we're looking for is more certainty around um, the end of the hiking cycle. I think we kind of there. Um, we're looking to and have been moving into um, global global bonds. So I think you know the, the type of the way the cycle works is you want to go from cash to bonds to equity. Uh, I think we've now into the to the bond phase, um, and we'll be you know trickling into equity. You know, really from a macro perspective, what we need to see is we need to see uh, for you know the, to me the U.S. Um, unemployment rate needs to go you know about four four and a bit percent before we can consider interest rate cuts. So you know it's very difficult to I think to argue for um, strong um, you know revenue growth for companies um, re-rating on the PE ratios and so on to justify stronger returns. So um, I think it's a it's a risk um, management exercise that we're going through now, uh, which is still able to provide decent returns. Thank you. Then I'm heard you saying you move from cash to bonds to equity. You didn't mention, mention property, but that was your highest expected return, both globally and locally. Um, and it's obviously been the worst performing asset class over most time periods now. Is it time to increase that exposure? I heard you saying that you worry about the volatility of the asset class, but are there any pockets that you think are looking attractive? Yeah, certainly. I think um, we, we, again, had to. We've started uh, deploying a little bit more into, into property. Um, again, you know, the, the type of, it's, it's the same, what, what we look at is the, the risk return. And, you know, if, if you ran numbers 10 years ago, um, you'd have a massive overweight in property with expected return of 6 or well, 3% above um, equities and bonds. But property has become more volatile than equities. So, you know, we, we don't want it for income anymore because bonds are giving us a better income. So it needs to compete, and and yeah, as you all know, there's so you know there possibly have been some structural changes in that market, uh, and one needs to look a bit a bit differently. We certainly, yeah, you know, we've got a very um, uh, well performing uh, property funds, um, which some of this cash is allocated to, um, and there too we will move gradually. But we need bond yields to be lower, to be honest, because it just I'd rather sit with thirteen percent in bonds. Um, right now, then and get another three percent maybe from from volatile equities. That makes perfect sense. Um, obviously, today you're presenting on the BCI Global Equity Fund. So, when you manage your asset classes in a balanced fund, do you look at different things that you would look at if you were just managing an equity fund or a fixed income fund? Well, I think we look at the same things. I think it's just when it comes to portfolio construction, it's different. So, you know, the balance fund we kind of call it internally is the best, the best ideas fund. Um, so we're not benchmark cognizant like we would be in a, uh, if it was in the bond and the all bond index uh, fund or in the equities to uh, SWIX or whatever it is. So then all the work that goes in is the same when it comes to portfolio construction. We like, we, we probably have less, um, less holdings, more conviction, and at times 
bigger over or underweights than we would in the, in the other type of um, index cognizant funds. Yeah, I, I want to ask you now about inflation linked bonds. Um, I think they're giving a real yield of around 5%, which I believe is your long term objective, yet you don't hold any in the balanced fund. It looks a little bit counterintuitive. Can you maybe just talk us through why that is? Yeah, this this um, love hate relationship with inflation and bonds. You know, you're right. I mean, you can you can buy them five percent, and um, in ten years you'll get your real return of five percent. Um, first of all, um, the first thing is that we kind of measure the the outcome here over like a three um, year rolling, um, and that inter that five percent real comes with a lot of uh, volatility. So as you know, in fact, interestingly enough, um, inflation and bonds are supposed to protect you against um, um, losing kind of real value. Um, inflation linked bonds are the only, other than property, are the only asset class that over the last 10 years actually gave you negative real returns. So it's not it's not a magic bullet. Um, we The problems are that, first of all, the market is less um, liquid and functional than the, the nominal bond market. Um, and maybe the most important is that nominal bond yields in South Africa over time have given you a, um, a kind of a, a generous inflation risk premium so you're getting more um you know more for for your your risk essentially and maybe the last thing is that there's definitely place for inflation in bonds uh, in funds you know the long the 30-year bond i don't think will be in, it doesn't have place i think in a balance fund but it might be um worthwhile as a long-term liability hedge uh, and so it, it does feature um we have been significantly high exposure um, then, but that would, would have been uh, early last year when inflation was rising. When inflation is falling, you rather be nominal bonds than inflation bonds. That protection that you're getting, you're getting more, of, I think, um, on nominal bonds, you know, compensation for that. Thank you, Johnny. I've got a couple more questions if we have time. I, I noticed there's still no questions from the audience, but maybe um, to give Keris a bit of um, time, Kiris, quite in interesting. You're a chemical engineer. How exactly does that fit into an asset management world? And how did you get into a portfolio manager <laughs> um, role um, after studying what you did? Um, it, it was a it was a slow transition. Um, you know, for, I actually did start out working in the engineering industry, so I did spend some time working for the likes of Shell and BP and the like. But over time, I, I had a greater interest in the sort of financial world and transitioned to it really by becoming a stock market analyst with the likes of Casanova and JP Morgan. So that's how I ended up where I am in, in portfolio management uh, these days. Um, but I, I think as an engineering background, I think it's just useful in terms of the more technical industries and an understanding of those. And I think it's also worth saying that I'm not the only chemical engineer in the team. I think we have three on board. Um, and I'd also like to point out that, uh, you know, we work within a broader team that brings many skill sets. So engineering is just one of them. Um, we have mathematicians, we have accountants, we even have, you know, economists, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think uh, it's, it's it, bringing all of that together is the interesting part for me. And it certainly improves the understanding of our underlying investment. I think that's an excellent response. Um, I'm a big believer in having different skill sets in a team because you have different lenses that you look at stocks and asset classes through. So um, it was just an interesting a little bit that I'm sure the audience didn't know about you. So thank you for sharing that. Um, what excites you the most about AI? A lot. But I think um, let me start by talking about the, the losers. Um, I think I think AI is going to be enormously disruptive for many, many industries. I think a lot of companies are currently facing their own Kodak moment um, and realizing that they, you know, this technology has the potential to 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 completely disrupt their business models. I mean, I'm thinking about things like, for example, translation services in the context of, say, ad global advertising, for example. Um, you know, there's companies that have been dedicated. Uh, with doing that sort of thing that uh, you can now use large language models and uh, achieve the same sort of result much, much uh, faster and, and, and with very high accuracy without any issues as far as the nuances of language and, and, and that sort of thing go. So I, th I think that's something to bear in mind. 
Other industries that are ripe for disruption are potentially sort of basic language education services and the like, I think, are, are, are also at risk. Um, and I think it, it may be too early to, to call the end of things like, uh, uh, say, Uber drivers, but I think transportation and logistics is also going to be seriously disrupted when we eventually get to full autonomy, um, you know, with self-driving vehicles and the like. The other thing I'd say about AI is that it's certainly not perfect. I mean, we've had some very high profile examples of where AI has not gone uh, according to plan. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure many people are aware of this, but in 2021, the, the Dutch government actually resigned as a result of an AI failure. Um, there was a, a scandal involving child welfare claims um, from the tax authorities where they were employing an AI algorithm to identify fraud. And they incorrectly, the model incorrectly targeted people as, as, as making fraudulent claims. Um, and it actually brought down the government. They had to resign in the end. It was that meaningful. So I think what that speaks to is we're going to need an element of regulation in AI to make sure that the checks and balances are in place. And then I can turn to the things that really excite me. I think beyond the large language models, for me, generative AI is transformative in many fields. And I'll, I'll give you an example of one, and that is perhaps in, say, medicine. Um, most of us have been through an MRI scan at some point in time. And, you know, the experience is that they take a long period of time. You are uncomfortable in a very expensive piece of equipment, uh, and it takes time for that, that, that scan to happen. What's happened is that uh, through generative AI models, what, what they've been able to do is, is teach these models to work with significantly less data and yet produce the same quality of scan at the end of the day. And what we're seeing, for example, now is that you can train an AI model with only a quarter of the data that a traditional scan would, 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 would generate. So what that speaks to is significant increases in productivity. You now have a very expensive machine that has four times the output. I think everyone can understand the economic value of that sort of thing. And I, I think there's many other instances where AI is going to be transformative. That would be things like discovering new medicines um, in the field of catalysis that would speak to new catalysts that will enable the production of, of new, new materials and, and, and the like. So yes, I am very excited about what the future holds and I can't wait to see what that looks like. Thank you. I think that uh, AI is certainly going to make some jobs a lot easier and, and quicker, as you say. But I think it also means that we have to have different skills in order to oversee what's true and what's not. Um, one of the big changes in South African regulation was the changes to Regulation 28 that came in last year that now allow us to um, take up to 45% of our portfolios offshore outside of South Africa. So. Do you think being based in London um, adds to your view and your ability to look at global stocks? Um, and where do you think it brings more value to a team like yours, where not everyone is based in South Africa? Um, yeah, I, I think being based in London, I think it really all revolves around access to global companies. And I, and I don't mean just those that are either listed here or headquartered here. Um, London as a financial hub is, is, is a great place for, for interacting with, with management teams, either through things like um, global conferences. You know, there's, there's very many conferences that are held annually uh, here in London. Um, in addition to that, um, there's a very significant shareholder base in the UK. And most corporates, including South African corporates, visit the UK with things like roadshows. And again, that provides opportunities for interactions. Um, there's also a very, very strong research coverage uh, that is UK based. Um, so again, um, you know, many global analysts are, are based here. So I think on the whole, it, 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 all of that taken together gives us a, 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 a very high level of access that is, that is particularly uh, useful. And then the final thing I, I'd sort of touch on is the fact that uh, London and Europe offer, you know, outside of, of, of the usual sort of sources of, 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 of industry contacts is things like industry expos. I'll give you an example. I attended um, you know, InterSolar, which is the world's largest solar expo in, in Germany. Um, and, and, and that sort of thing is a fantastic forum to go and meet companies 
and, and to perhaps talk to people that are in the unlisted space and get views on the listed uh, players. And, and you know, there, there you have an unbiased uh, opinion being expressed. So uh, on the whole, I think uh, it's, 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 it's really all about access and inf information. And, and I think it really does add. Thank you very much. I know we've run out of time. Eugene's back on. Um, so thank you, Karis, Johnny, for um, very interesting presentations. Always a pleasure to be able to tap into your expertise. Um, and to the BCI team and Eugene specifically, thank you for giving us the opportunity to uh, moderate. Um, for our viewers, if there's any further questions, please get hold of your BCI representative and they will be able to answer them. And thank you all for your time. Thank you. And Jonathan, thank you so much for an absolutely great session. Uh, Jonathan, I normally tell clients, you know, the proof is in the pudding. Uh, we're all very familiar with your long only equity capabilities, your fixed income capabilities, but it's amazing to see how everything comes together in your balance fund. Uh, in relative terms, still a fairly new fund launched in December 2019, probably a very difficult time to launch a fund. Uh, but I look at your performance, absolute and relative terms, you just about out, outperform uh, the peer group by uh, double the amount over one year. So the fund really works. And it's really great to see how all these capabilities of Vigio comes together in a balanced fund with your asset allocation views. Uh, Flo, again, from our side, thank you so much for your time. I know you're off to another meeting. You've got a full day ahead. Uh, and thank you so much to our audience next week, Wednesday, the 21st of June. Uh, please join us again. We will have the Sashfin team with us and we'll unpack a lot of these views a bit further. Thank you so much and hope to see you all again next week, Wednesday. Thank you.